Welcome to Future Talk, where we discuss the latest developments in technology and try to see where the new technology is leading us. This is actually our first program after an almost four-year hiatus caused by the pandemic. But that's behind us now, and we look forward to bringing you a new series of programs with knowledgeable guests who can offer keen insights into the latest tech trends. Today's program deals with artificial intelligence. It's been hailed as one of the most revolutionary technologies ever, and it's already begun to impact society in ways that we don't yet understand. We're going to discuss how it works, what it can accomplish, and the potential risk factors as well. I have three guests. Greg Mikowski is head of data science solutions at Cybernator, an AI startup company. Nara Seema Krishnakumar is also a co-founder of Cybernator and serves as a strategic advisor there. And Yashas Shroff is an AI ecosystem product manager at Intel Corporation. Gentlemen, welcome to the program. Now, Greg, I understand that AI is not totally new. People have talked <laughs> about it for a long time. But it's only in the past few years that it's really picked up a lot of momentum. What accounts for this huge outburst of energy at this time? Well, I mean, AI has become very important over a long time period. It's, it's just another tool. There's been a lot of tools people have used from the printing press to uh, electricity, the phone, and much more. And so with uh, AI, it's really helping to solve new problems, problems that people haven't really been solving as much before, or solving it much more efficiently than we've solved in the past. And so a lot of what AI has been doing is just getting much broader, much more, more pervasive. Um, <clears throat> so AI is a thinking and reasoning tool. And so that's what's helping uh, also solve problems in a much larger and more scalable fashion, um, easier to reproduce. Now, I understand that it uses something called neural networks. At least some types of AI use neural networks. What exactly is a neural network? Um, can you pull up the, full, the first slide? So we'll show a slide for that. Yes, on what a neural network is. There's a credit scoring example that I can talk to. Yeah, so on the left, we've got some of the input fields for a credit scoring example. So that might be things like uh, missed payments or a loan to income ratio. And so those are input fields uh, going through the nodes of the neural network. On the right side of the output would be an estimate of credit risk. And so we would be training a model with past examples of, of people's behavior and some of the outcomes. Uh, there's connections between the neural network uh, that looks like pipes in this diagram. The wider pipes are thicker. They have more influence. Uh, they uh, impact uh, prediction much more. And the smaller connections are weaker, uh, so less helpful. So there are a bunch of factors that are taken into consideration. And in a real example, maybe it would be thousands of factors, not just five or six. Exactly. And yeah. they're weighted. And it's, it's sort of an iterative process deciding how much weight yeah. to give. And so a neural net would have two modes, a training mode and an, and an inference mode. And that's kind of like people going to school the first years of their life, and that's the training mode. And then an inference mode is like going to work. And so with a neural net, the training mode is a time where you're training it over time. And then when you freeze the weights, you freeze the learning. It's not changing anymore. Now you're applying it um, in work mode. The work mode would be you get uh, new records that you're going to judge for a credit score. You see new examples of of a person's um, different uh, attributes. Now I understand it's called a neural network because it's supposed to replicate the function of the human brain, the way the mind learns, the way the mind processes experience. How close is it to really simulating uh, the human brain? Um, so there's another slide for that. Can we see that next slide, please? So on here, the analogy, uh, the uh, neural nets are roughly biologically inspired by a neural net um, of a human brain, but it's, it's a rough inspiration. And it's not, it doesn't have the same constraints that a biology system would have. Just the way that an airplane would be inspired by the shape of a bird's wing, but airplane fuel isn't worms. <laughs> mm. And so, so on the left side of that diagram, we have the input senses. You might see a tiger, and you might hear a tiger roar. Um, and then the output would be make a quick fight or flight decision. And so, the, to speak of, on the biological inspiration, there's different kinds of subsystems within a brain. There might be a, a fast learning and a low learning. So the fast would be the fight or flight, and then the slower system would be more of the uh, detailed thought analysis. 
Now, how powerful is AI right now compared to a human brain? Because the human mind is incredibly complex. This is a machine, but machines have capabilities that humans might not. Yeah. So one measure, and it's not a measure of everything, is the number of neurons in a neural net and the number of cells in a uh, brain. So a human brain might have about 86 billion neurons. Some of these large language models might have anywhere from 7 billion to over a trillion weights. So it could be much more than a person. But just the count of weights isn't everything. There's a lot of very different architectures. The architectures between processing vision, processing hearing, processing language. So those are things that we've been modeling. Uh, some of the other things, like uh, simulating uh, kind of a simulation of the world that's going on outside and understanding that. There's other things we have to catch up and get more. Now, is there any hope of computers being able to think as well as humans, basically solve any problem that a human could solve, or are we still pretty far away from that? Well, there's something called a, a Turing test. And so a Turing test would be if you're typing on one end and you don't know there's somebody typing in another room. You don't know if it's an AI or if it's a, a person typing back. Mm -hmm. And so in the Turing test, then if I'm fooled and it's an AI in a system, then that would be the AI passing the Turing test. So in that extent, uh, sometimes that could be passed, sometimes it couldn't. If you compare a neural net with a person, a person could be a three-year-old, a three-month-old, a 30-year-old. So what level of person do you think it is? So there's different degrees of human capability, different degrees of AI capability. Now, some people are saying that AI is so important. It's one of the most important technologies in the history of the world, maybe you know, bigger than the internet, which is a major thing. What makes it so important? How are our lives going to be that much different because we have it? Well, uh, the neural net has certainly been connecting a major portion of the human population, and whether it's uh, cell phones or any kind of devices. So that has definitely been huge, and that's become a more mature market. As old as AI is, it's still in a very accelerated growth phase. And so things are still rapidly changing from year to year, uh, much more so than the internet is. And part of what these large language models, when you start training them, one of the basic things is all of the internet, or most of it. And so that would be one thing of many it consumes in order to train it. And so on top of that, it's doing a lot more learning and reasoning. So it's a learning tool, it's a reasoning tool. I think it becomes kind of essential. A famous person uh, recently <coughs> said that in another 10 years, there'll just be two kinds of companies, so that those that use AI and those that are out of business. <laughs> <laughs> you think there's any merit to that? Well, I think of AI as mo uh, more augmenting human intelligence, so to help people. Sometimes I like to think of it as a, a junior intern that's helping you be more productive, but it's an intern that can't ask questions. Mm -hmm. It's an intern that you might have to micromanage. And so you ask uh, first thing, you get uh, some answers back, but no, no, I want to guide you a little bit this way. You get something else back, no, no, go turn that way a little bit. So it can help you be much more productive. It can help you be faster in your job if it's well configured. But um, I don't see it uh, certainly replacing my job in, in uh, five or 10 years. Now, Krishna, there are a lot of uses for AI. Can you sketch out some of the broad uses, some of the main areas that we might see AI in our lives in the near future? Yeah, great question. I think um, you know today you see a lot of uh, chatter about ChatGPT, where you can ask it a question and it will summarize the answer for you. It looks at various sources of information. Uh, it provides you an answer. It generates content. You can ask it to write a story. You can ask it to write uh, you know, your resume, for example. You can ask it to do various things, and you can prompt it to do various things. That is one example of AI, where you, know, you are interacting <coughs> with the system, you are prompting the system to help you create that content. Now, there are other applications that are prevalent in the market today. There are a class of solutions called computer vision solutions, where camera data is being analyzed. This could be a video monitoring solution, for example. That's there you know, across um, multiple retail stores. You will see that there are uh, video uh, camera solutions that will enable you to detect various things. There are also workplace safety solutions, where you can detect in, in a construction setting, you can detect if somebody is being safe. Are they wearing a hard hat in an area where there could be objects falling, debris falling? So that's another example of these types of AI solutions. They are alerting users on what could go wrong, and you know they're promoting the workplace safety. And one final example is in building, which is near to me, uh, where you're using AI 
to improve the sustainability as well as decarbonize the planet. And you're doing that by reducing the energy consumption within the building. One obvious example of uh, computer vision, for example, is uh, self-driving cars. Correct. Where you recognize every object, calculate its speed and distance and direction. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty sophisticated and your life depends on it getting it right. Correct. So um, it looks like we're, we're pretty close to being there where automatic driving is almost pretty trustworthy right now. It is. And that sounds like just one of the things. But, but aren't there also some potential problems? A lot of people have talked about dangers of AI. Mm -hmm. What are some of the possible risks, that can, things that can go wrong with AI? Yeah, so there are uh, several areas. As um, it was mentioned, data is the foundation for any artificial intelligence solution. As we have learned, as humans have learned, we have been exposed to different data points and we are constantly inferencing and we are learning on the go. So if the data is corrupt, if you train the model in a wrong way, you can, you can cause the AI to provide you wrong answers. One classic example would be, you know, you're interacting with chat GPT, you're asking it a question and you get a wrong answer. And that wrong answer could be induced by a third party actor. So that's one risk. Um, there are also other limitations as it relates to AI, right? It's like, you know, can you get it right? Have you had, have you had training with enough data so that you can get the answer right. That's, that's an evolution process. I think there is 95% accuracy. There is a measurement of accuracy with respect to AI solutions. So there are a lot of opportunities to train the AI models with a lot of data. So data is the foundation. And I would say anything that uh, you know, bad actors do to pollute the data or you know, manipulate it in a way can create harm for the users of AI. Well, could bad actors just train it on the data that they please? Can anyone? start with a basic AI and just train it to do whatever they want to do, even if it's a highly malevolent, like uh, ask it, what's the best way to rob a bank? What's yes, the best way to rob a, a crypto bank? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's possible where you know, bad actors can influence some of the answers and some of the usage of AI. And that's where you know, I think um, the Biden administration has uh, promoted an executive order right now. And you know, there is, um, there is protection from a AI use perspective. They want to protect the privacy of users of AI as well as promote safe, uh, ethical, and responsible use of AI. Yeah, I heard that the president did issue this executive order recently on AI. Um, there are some questions whether he might have the legal authority to demand all the things because I think AI companies will be required to report certain things to the government, but. But overall, if you're familiar with the document itself, does it sound like something that'll like, you know, really solve some problems or, or maybe just you know, push them more under the surface? I, I think it's a step in the right direction where the focus is primarily protecting the users of AI. You, know, you want to protect the privacy of users so that you know, they cannot use the information that users are providing while interacting with AI to induce any manipulation or fraudulent behavior or even deception. So that's, that's kind of one aspect of it. And there have been, you know, the executive order states that, you know, you want to set guidelines as well as you want to establish committees and regulations in terms of how to protect the users. I think that's a step in the right direction. And the second piece is users need to feel safe when they're using AI. Uh, they need to be uh, able to trust it, you know, where they can trust the output that is coming back from the AI, as well as, you know, have bad actors uh, be really disincentivized to not induce certain wrong answers and deceive people. So that's, that's kind of the high order, uh, you know, from an executive perspective, and I think that's, in the, that's a step in the right direction. I'm kind of curious to know how the AI companies are taking the new regulations are they saying, gee, these are really good, we'll be happy to abide by these regulations? Or are they saying, this is going to place a burden on us which is going to impede innovation? Now you have your own startup here. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, how do you feel? Do you, feel, do you welcome yeah. these regulations? I do welcome these regulations. I think you know, the uh, protection of users is of prime importance for all, all of us involved. We are also developers of technology and we are users of technology. So it is in our best interest to protect users of AI as well as develop it in a way where we are promoting safety, responsibility, and ethical use of AI. Now to have these really intelligent machines, it must require enormous amounts of computing power. I think that's 
one of the things that enabled it, following Moore's law that <coughs> computer power roughly uh, doubles every couple of years, mm -hmm. and you do that for about 40 or 50 years, mm -hmm. computers can crunch quantities of data that would have been unthinkable mm -hmm. years ago, and it's, it's continuing, the momentum is still continuing. Um, do you think that privacy can ever be an absolute in the age of computers, or do we might have to accept the fact that your life is just going to be an open book at some point, like privacy might be in cameras everywhere, microphones everywhere? Mm -hmm. I, I think, uh, you know, there have been several regulations like GDPR and even our state of California has information where any uh, private information that is collected on behalf of a user, uh, you need to consent to that information being collected. And there are regulations on how long that information can be kept inside a computer. So there are regulations around that. So I think, you know, privacy is... Uh, again, there is a use of the system as well as, you know, how much of uh, information gets collected. So as long as the regulations are protecting the users, you know, I think we are in a good spot with respect to privacy. I've heard that AI can even be very damaging to the environment because it requires such enormous amounts of electricity, kind of like, uh, you know, Bitcoin in a way, mm -hmm. uh, that it just consumes enormous amounts of fuel. Is that a potential limiting factor at some point, do you think? Um, you know, I think, uh, as you pointed out earlier, the compute power has been expanding. And I think we are going to see a lot of expansion of cloud and hyperscalers. That's where a lot of data compute is being used, rather than, you know, uh, it being distributed and you have scale across the globe. So it's going to be concentrated to the cloud providers, where there is going to be enormous compute. And that's going to be elastically available to uh, creators as well as users of AI. So I don't think it's going to cause that much of an impact on the planet. As well as, you know, you have other solutions, AI-driven solutions that I talked about, where you're going to reduce the energy consumption and you want to do it in a very smart way mm -hmm. using technology. So I think we'll be in a good spot with respect to, you know, uh, using compute power as well as, you know, uh, driving some of the outcomes for users. Okay, very good. Now, Yesh, um, this technology is not only fantastically amazing, but it's causing a massive investment boom. Tons and tons of money are pouring mm -hmm. into AI development. Where is most of this money going? Where is most of the development happening? Well, as uh, Krishna just mentioned, right, uh, a big chunk of it is actually going into the building of ever larger uh, data centers. Data centers are effectively large uh, racks of compute that are set up with uh, liquid cooling, and some of them are actually being shifted closer to the uh, North Pole because you know it's it's easier to run these uh, these hot machines. But um, largely, you know, these investments are also happening um, in the area of developing more efficient chips. For instance, uh, you know, uh, companies like uh, AWS, um, uh, Amazon, Intel, NVIDIA, many other companies, they're working really fast and furiously to develop chips that are not just more efficient, they compute better, and they're solving problems that are particularly tied to the type of uh, algorithms that neural networks actually um, offer. And so these, these efficient architectures are making this problem, you know, less prevalent than it would otherwise be. So you have very specialized chips for very specialized applications. Indeed. Indeed. And uh, innovation is also not just coming from, you know, traditional, uh, you know, chip houses. It's coming from, uh, uh, you know, startups. Uh, there is a tremendous amount of venture capital investment that's now happening in the hardware space, which, uh, you know, typically venture capitalists, you know, shied away from a lot of hardware investments because it is a little bit more risky, uh, longer term um, for it to, uh, you know, realize its uh, uh, IRR, their mm -hmm. internal rate of return. Uh, but increasingly, because of this uh, massive opportunity space that we are finding ourselves in, uh, there is there is thought, uh, you know, in terms of building compute architectures that are um, not the traditional type of architectures. Uh, what do I mean by that? Um, you have, you know, traditionally, for instance, uh, this one Newman architecture, there's a particular way of, you know, memory and compute working together um, to go and solve a problem. We are seeing architectures that are more 
neural network based architectures. There are companies uh, that are also focusing on um, analog, uh, you know, way of uh, doing a certain type of uh, uh, compute. And so, in a sense, we are almost going back to the drawing board to figure out, you know, what is the best way to use hardware most effectively to solve this particular niche of problem without, you know, um, sacrificing a lot of uh, raw power. Well, let's talk about some specific applications sure. of AI. For example, what applications can we expect to see in the field of medicine? So, medicine is one of those most, uh, you know, fervent areas of, uh, uh, sorry, fertile areas of uh, investments uh, by researchers. For instance, uh, you know, one of the examples that Krishna mentioned earlier, right, was on uh, imaging side. So, take for example, um, MRI images. Uh, so today you would have a radiologist that would uh, look at you know a 3D scan of a of a patient's brain, and uh, would want to identify say the presence of a tumor, and if it is there, the size, the volume of the tumor. And so, when you have you know millimeter uh, scans of the brain in a 3D volume, it becomes a little time consuming, um, and you need to be an expert to look at it. Uh, but AI. Um, algorithms can do this much faster. So it might be a good diagnostic tool. It's a good diagnostic tool that's not necessarily going to replace what the radiologist does, but aids in uh, in the professional's activities. Um, there are other areas in medicine, for instance, where um, I was I was having a really great conversation with one of my um, surgeon cousins, and uh, he mentioned how there's you know a lot of uh, a difference in, in opinion, um, uh, the, the reports that come back from different readers of uh, the same image. And so AI, by having looked at millions of images, can actually, you know, help reduce that variability. So if you're a patient, you know, um, you get more accurate diagnosis the first time around. So interpreting x-rays, for example. Yeah. I understand. CT drug, scans and others, yeah. Drug development also. Uh, usually have to test many, many drugs to find one that works, and this allows you to eliminate a lot of drugs that have very low possibility, and it speeds up the whole process. Indeed, indeed. Um, pharmaceutical uh, area, so you're finding actually that um, companies, whether it's in pharmaceutical space, it's in the space of finance, uh, medicine, um, uh, transportation, we talked about uh, automated driving, ADAS, uh, AI is infusing itself in all of these spaces um, to actually help uh, reduce the burden on the, on the professionals, but also helping them create new ways of touching ancillary areas and being more effective in what they are doing. Even the uh, protein folding problem, trying to understand how proteins fold, that is a huge problem that I think was recently pretty much solved by AI, which is a big step forward. Yeah, it is getting there. It is getting there. There is, there's, you know, lots of news out there that, you know, uh, suggest that there is, you know, tremendous amount of, uh, you know, it is a 3D folding mechanism. And so, uh, AI is being used to help with some of that drug discovery part. Um, large language models is actually another space where, um, you know, it takes millions of dollars actually to develop one of the models that Greg just talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. And so, how do you take these base models and then fine tune them for your specific case is actually a very interesting area of research as well. Now, another area that people are very interested in is finance. Can AI tell me what stocks to buy? <laughs> <laughs> I wish, right? Um, uh, in a way, you know, it, it oh, so. How it works is that, you know, for example, with these large language models, let us say some breaking news comes about, uh, you know, for some company, right? In milliseconds, you can have uh, a large language model interpret the signals from that news. And in nanoseconds, take an action to buy or sell that particular commodity. Um, and so, it, it becomes, you know, a race of, you know, who is developing models that can interpret data faster and faster at what volume and how can we actually fine tune those models for your specific use case. Now another example might be architecture. If you specify that you want to build a building that does certain things, it might come up with a design that no human being would ever have thought of. 
I think the new Google headquarters in Mountain View used some artificial intelligence. I assume you've seen the building. It's like yes. nothing you've ever seen before. <laughs> yes. In fact, it uh, almost seems like a, um, a very collaborative way of uh, you know, working with AI to look at an entire design space and essentially uh, you know, evaluate ideas that you would not necessarily think of. So it's not that I as an engineer you know, or product manager is gonna, am I necessarily going to be an architect tomorrow, but how is AI going to help an architect? How is it going to help a sound engineer? How is it going to help you know, a coder write code? So you'll have uh, many efficient tools out there to help you, much like mm -hmm. I think how electricity revolutionized uh, you know, the 19th uh, century. Okay. Well, gentlemen, this has been a fabulous discussion. I'd like to thank all of you for coming today. It's time for us to wrap. I'd like to thank you for watching. Look forward to seeing you the next time. I'm Marty Wasserman, and we'll see you soon.